welcome to The Interesting Podcast, episode number 112. This episode is with my buddy John Armijo. He's also known as America's Movie Cop, and uh, we talk about how he got that title. We talk about how we met. Uh, it was actually at a convention a few years ago. I drove uh, a few hours to go meet him, and he could not have been nicer. We've been friends ever since. Uh, we talk about how he got started working in movies. We talk about the different videos he's made from his Pop-Tart adventures, which are hilarious, to his upcoming Star Wars fan film called Hopeless. We even talk about how his past of running businesses has helped him in running a set and producing his own different kinds of projects, how those two things translate things that he's learned in the past that work on sets as well. And then we actually get into uh, his battle with cancer. John is a cancer survivor, and it's pretty amazing how candid he is, and he's very honest about what that was like, the mental side of it. It, it was amazing to hear. And uh, I've always uh, really loved John and his perspective and how he handles life. And now even more so. You're going to love it. And then he talks about coming out on the other side of that and just really appreciating life as it's here. It's just great. John has a great perspective. He's a great dude with great stories. So let's just jump right into it. Please enjoy the interesting podcast episode number 112 with John Armijo. Theme song time. So how you been? 2020 treating you good? Uh, yeah, no complaints. I good. rarely have anything to complain about, so. That's good. Being busy, doing my thing. Right on, right on. I found that complaining doesn't help anyway. No, just focus and fix it. Yeah, there you go. I'm into it. I'm into <laughs> it. Yeah, I was just thinking the other day, I was like, the day, because we met at that convention. Uh, Auburndale, Auburndale Convention in Florida. Yeah, I remember that because it was like a four and a half hour drive for me. And I was like, yes, what? I also have an excellent memory, so I remember everything. Oh, good. I have a terrible memory. So <laughs> <laughs> you can ask me where I met anybody, the circumstances, and I'll tell you. Perfect. So, uh, I'll, I'll even answer the question. Yeah, please do. Uh, where do we Auburndale, meet? Auburndale, Florida. <laughs> uh, 2016, I want to say. What? Was it really? Mm hmm. Wow. I was there, and I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> and you uh, lived in Southern Florida. Yep, and still you do. drove four and a half hours uh, in your Imperial Commander 501st outfit. Ooh. You said I wanted to get into a movie, and I want to sit here and talk to you. So I said, come sit behind the table with me and Michael Yeager and ask us anything you want to ask. That is amazing. Mm -hmm. And, and exactly we sat there and talked happened. about four or five hours. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the real thing that I remember, because I, I remember the drive, because mm -hmm. I had worked the night before. And right. I got off too. at like seven or something in the morning, and then I and drove. you were exhausted. Yeah, <laughs> it's like mm -hmm. delirious. <laughs> but yeah, I... you told me that when you got there, and I said, "Well, we're not going to blow this guy off. You need to sit down and uh, get your money's worth, and sit down and hang out with us." Yeah, and you did. I remember you mm -hmm. pulled up a you pulled up a chair, and you were like, mm -hmm. "Here, so what do you want to know?" And I was like, "Well, mm -hmm. here we go. <laughs> you know, I'm going to make you regret asking that question." <laughs> no, that's that's what we're there for. So let me ask you this: though. was that the response that you expected? Uh, no, no, it was way better. <laughs> I expect you to be like, yeah, no, I, I've done a couple things. All right, yeah, well, uh, next in line. See you later. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. But instead, you were like, pop a squat. What do you want to yep. know? Have a seat. Yeah, it was great. It was great. Because at the cool. time, you know, with Florida, we used to have a ton of tax incentives here for, like, movies mm -hmm. and entertainment. And then yeah. we got Rick Scott, and he was like, mm, better not. And so it was difficult to kind of figure out how to even navigate this sort of thing because – the thing that I've learned specifically at, like, background level mm -hmm. is, like, nobody tells you anything. Correct. Ever. So it's like, how are you even mm -hmm. going to get this information? So I remember on the website, it was like, John Armijo is going to be here, and he's going to do this thing, and he's going to talk about, like, how he got into it. And I was like, mm -hmm. that's worth a four-and-a-half-hour drive. Yeah. And, and the, answer is, the answer is background. So yeah. I got into it. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Because the way I see it, and uh, I'm sure we discussed all this before, but it's probably worth repeating for this podcast i don't remember it <laughs> <laughs> that's true you probably don't um you have to, if you want to get into film you have to get onto a set yep it doesn't matter how and i'm a pretty logical dude people say well i want to go to film school i got to get an agent i got to do this i got to do that if i'm going to get into film absolutely incorrect 
yep. in my opinion. Everything I'm about to say is my opinion. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and uh, my interpretation. So in my opinion, don't waste your money. Find any way to get onto a set and spend some time because you may do that and say, you know what? I absolutely hate this. I have no desire to sit here for 15, 16 hours and watch psh, essentially a construction crew. For real. And do the same thing over and over again. So people say, I need to go to film school and all that. No, you don't. Get onto a set for five or ten times. See if you even like it. That's smart. And then decide if you want to proceed. When you get onto a set, you're going to start meeting people. Even if you're sitting in the background holding tent, you're going to start talking to people. Hey, this guy wants to get into stunts. This guy wants to be a caterer. You just start talking to people, and things start happening. That's true. It's true. Yeah. Getting That's real all experience my, uh, as well. Yeah, and you, uh, you start to learn the, uh, the vernacular of being on a set because all sets, whether it's a $300 million picture or an indie, the vernacular and the basic principles are always the same. That's true. That's true. Mm -hmm. And so. if I remember correctly, were you in the restaurant business first? Yes. Hey. Well, yeah, still am. Oh, sweet. I've got, I've got partnerships and own businesses, and my wife and I own properties. So, yeah. There you go. Killing it on multiple yeah, I mean, fronts. Uh, yeah. I mean, my whole life, uh, business owner, and mm -hmm. uh, I applied that knowledge to uh, my work in film also. That's cool. Yeah. So, uh, yep, yep. You got to take what you know and apply it. So, uh, you know, I manage hundreds of people, thousands right. throughout my life. Cool. And, uh, as long as, and I apply that because when I started getting into producing the past three years or so, I, I've got to find a way to, uh, apply what I know to make things work. So I ended up falling more into a producer role because oh. I can make phone calls and make things happen. I, I have a vast network of resources I can always call on. And I would compare being a producer to being a CEO, being a director to being a manager. Makes sense. And then, yep, then you have actors, department heads, and all that, and that's your employees and your, your, you know, your shift leaders, I guess. Sure. Or your lower management. And uh, when I started looking at it that way, it all found a place. Mm, okay, so, okay. Oh, how you look at it. Yeah, it's interesting how that translates. Mm-hmm. And I remember, let's see, we're just going to go through my memory of like what I don't cool. remember, what I remember and what I don't. And I, mm -hmm. so I remember you lived either in or near New Orleans. Uh, I'm about 45 minutes outside New Orleans. Okay. Close enough for me. Cool. Are you from there? No. I'm actually from Southern California. I've been here for oh. about 20 years. No way. Yeah. But the funny thing is I didn't get into film until I got to New Orleans. Right, right. <laughs> of course. Of yep. course. Everyone's in California. you got to make your own way. Well, here's, here's that old logic again. You figure – I'm from Southern California. Mm -hmm. You figure Southern California's population alone is probably about you know, 25, 30 million. Right. Everybody's there for the entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. The entire population of Louisiana is 4 million people Ooh. with half a million in New Orleans and how many people are involved in film. Your chances for success are much higher. Sure. Just based on numbers alone. Sure. So wait, was – was getting into the entertainment industry, was that always like on the back burner? Was that a plan or was it something you just kind of walked into? Well, you know, uh, being a kid, you know, I grew up reading comic books and playing with Star Wars and all that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you always have this dream, man, I'd love to do this, I'd love to do this. And you do drama and plays as a kid. And I did a lot of writing as oh, a kid. Oh, really? Yeah, a lot of drawing and writing and had my own stories and all. But it's a pipe dream, right. you know? It's never, I mean, living in California, I never even attempted it. It yeah. wasn't even a thought. <laughs> sure. So then uh, I moved to New Orleans in 2002, this area. And uh, a buddy of mine had a cousin who was doing background. And I'm a big G.I. Joe fan my whole life. Yeah. And uh, so a friend, his, his, my friend, his cousin mentioned it to my buddy. My buddy uh, got a, an interview or something with the casting director. And he mentioned it to me. He says, hey, I've got a appointment with this casting director for G.I. Joe 2 to see if I can get on. Would you like to come? And I didn't think much about it. You know, I said, I'll go with you. We'll go have lunch. Yeah. And at the time, I used to go to the gym every day. And I was never the rock. But, you know, <laughs> I was in shape. And, and Few humans you know, are. <laughs> I look mean and shaved head and all that stuff. So I went and waited. And they had their meeting. They came out. And she said to me, hey, are you signed up with my company? And I said, no. She said, would you like to be? I said, I guess. She says, well, you have a great look. I can get you a lot of parts as a cop and soldier and stuff like that. So I said, oh, sure, whatever. Didn't think much about it. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And uh, that day, she signed me on his background for five movies in a day. What? Yeah, and the first one was Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter. 
Oh, sweet. So I heard this name and I said, well, listen, I'm not really interested in doing college. <laughs> Bullshit, you know? Sure. <laughs> and uh, she says, no, no, this is a big $90 million budget. Tim Burton's the uh, producer. And it's like, oh, okay, that's different. It's well, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just started accepting everything just as I got uh, into it to just kind of learn what the whole thing was about, you know, and, and observing and, and being involved. And uh, again, logical dude. I said, all right, this is a job. Right. Got to check the ego, come in here, be a good employee, take direction, blah, blah, blah. Which surprisingly, most, most people don't take it that way. That's true. You know? And you've experienced it, I'm sure, and it's, most people don't take that approach. Yep. And a uh, very small community, so mm -hmm. pretty quickly I'd walk onto a set, and just because of my look, even before I ever worked in film, I would always get mistaken for a, a soldier. I'd go to Home Depot, they'd try to offer me a discount, people think for my <laughs> service. I swear to God, it happens all the time, still to this day. And... Uh, so I would walk onto sets and, uh, you know, I was playing a SWAT guy or whatever, and they would just hand me guns, assuming that I knew what I was doing. And I kept my mouth shut. Of course. And went with it. <laughs> and you got to take yes, what you and. can get. <laughs> so, uh, you know, on sets, there's a lot of downtime. Yeah. And you start meeting people and talking to people. So I started talking to the guys that really were in the military, really police officers. They started showing me how guns worked and how to do this and do that. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I started getting onto other movies and they would give you actual, you know, stunt training and stuff like that. So I just went pretty quickly to what's, you know, called special ability. Cool. And uh, my only goal was to get on G.I. Joe. That's it. Right. I didn't care about anything else. I just wanted to get on G.I. Joe. It's your jam. Yep. So pretty quickly I went into, you know, featured extra and special ability. And I started getting good scenes, you know, with like uh, big actors. Yeah. Um, because, you know, again, you behave yourself and you become a go-to guy. True. Works out. So then I uh, got a call finally. I said, hey, they're going to start casting for gi joe and i knew who was casting it so i made sure that i maintained my relationship with that casting agency and uh smart yep so they called they said all right john director's coming in next week he wants to pick i think it was 20 core Krober troopers for gi joe retaliation Ooh. and i couldn't make it i had to go to la for something completely unrelated back home oh. so i said i can't make it so i was bummed and i said but when i get back you know i'll take anything you can give me hot dog vendor whatever yeah <laughs> So as I also learned back at that time is that a lot of people overcommit. They would say, oh, yeah, I could do three months. And then they say, no, I can't. I got to work. Right. But they commit to it. So within a week, they said, hey, we've had a ton of people drop out. Can you give us I think it was like three months or something on and off? Dude. So I said, sure. And uh, so, um, again, being a good employee, people would call out, miss, you know, they all cancel. And I became their go-to guy that they could call me. And I'd say, sure, I'll be right there, you know. Yeah. So I worked on the whole production for, you know, three or four months. and uh, No way. Yeah. Um, whenever there's Cobra Troopers in that movie, I'm in there. So, uh, Dude. From, uh, from that point, you know, we wrapped and had a great time. I mean, unbelievable experience. So I jokingly said to the uh, casting director on last day, I said, hey, um, just remember who you called every single time you needed help. I want a really good part <laughs> on your next movie. But I have a very dry sense of humor, say it with a straight face. And yeah, I, was I kidding. love it. <laughs> so like a month later. So my wife said to me, hey, uh, you got what you wanted. You're going to continue to do this. And I said, no, I don't have to do this. So I'll just take it on a case-by-case -case basis. Right. So then like a month later, the phone rang. She, uh, the cast director called me back. She said, hey, John, uh, remember what you said? And I got you a really good part. So what are you talking about? <laughs> she said, uh, well, you said, you know, I, you took care of me to get you a really good part of the next one. I said, yeah, that was, was a joke, but what you got? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and she said, well, Russell Crowe needs a bodyguard in a movie called Broken City. Oh, my God. For like three days. So, again, part of the core bodyguard group. It was four of us for three days. But, again, you're in the action, you know. Right. And uh, so just kind of went with that and then uh, just kind of got picky as far as what I wanted to do. So my niche and my look, I got into, you know, cops and soldiers and bodyguards and thugs and mean dudes yeah. and uh just went with it and uh started to build a reputation a little network group and uh then we get to 2013 and dawn of the planet of the apes rolls around yeah you know what i missed a big part of that story let me backtrack <laughs> six gi joe retaliation was supposed to be um released i forget when but it was delayed six months mm-hmm and a few months later, they called me back from G.I. Joe, and they said, hey, John, um, they're going to come back and do some reshoots. We already have your you know, your uniform, and the director wants to meet with you to see if you come in and audition for some lines. Ooh. And I said, okay. So ran down there, didn't get it, 
and uh, got the call. I said, well, he didn't get it, but he wants you to come back in a non-speaking role regardless. Mm-hmm. I said, I'm happy to do it. So we got on set. I ended up getting bumped oh. um, to lines. So if you watch that movie now in the scene at the end where the uh, Cobra Army is attacking London, you hear a lot of voiceover, and that's me. What? So that's where I got my SAG eligibility was on that movie. Smart. Um, so my goal was, you know, to have that done within a year. Because you set goals for yourself. And I yeah, like that. Be of course. Within a year. I think, uh, I think I did it nine months. Dude. You know, by just being a good employee. Not being a shithead. Yeah. Wow. So, uh, yeah. Then went from there. Then, you know, we fast forward and continued to do it for years. And then uh, Don, the plan of the Apes rolls around. And that just opened so many doors. Because by this point, um, you know, I knew everybody. Had a great relationship with casting. And uh, they had their niche for me, and they always knew that I was reliable and, Mm -hmm. you know, not a problem. So uh, when I heard that movie was coming to town, I said, I I really want to be an ape. They said, no, you don't want to be an ape. I really (laughs) do want to be an ape. And they said, no, you don't. I I said, I want to wear that makeup, you know. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, they're like, it's a little different now. (laughs) Yeah, they said, nope, they're going to be CGI. You don't want to be an ape. I said, Mm -hmm. you're right. I don't want to be an ape. (laughs) So uh, if you've watched that movie, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. Yeah. There's a dude in there, an actor, I think his name's like Kirk Acevedo or something. Mm -hmm. And he looks just like me, or I look like him, however you want to say it. Perfect. But uh, they wanted me to go in there as a photo double for him. Oh. And I said, I'm 100% not interested. Right. And she said, the cast director said, I don't care. Just come meet the director anyway, because that's how (laughs) I'm going to get you in front of him. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay. Because she was on my side. She knew I wanted to be in the movie. Right. So got in front of him, and he wants me to be this dude's photo double staying in for three months, like, really not interested yeah but uh they ended up going with somebody else and uh then she said to him hey this is john army who does a lot of our cop stuff blah 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 and he looked at me and he said uh i think his name is matt reeves the director he's doing batman now yeah but uh he says can you give us uh can you give us three or four weeks and i said sure so i did three or four weeks on that then we did a lot of stunt shit on that i mean explosions really? and gunfire and it was insane but that opened so many doors because uh, as I got in with that group, um, you know, then they started calling me for, you know, they called me for Jurassic World. Right. They called me for Logan. They called me for Cloak and Dagger. Suddenly, I'm not tracking down the jobs. Now they're starting to come to me. Again, there just based go. on being a good employee and not being a shithead. Yeah. <laughs> it makes, I mean, it's such a small it community that mm-hmm. it gets around, you know? Yeah. And uh, you just come in, do your job, stay humble. Do what's asked of you. Yeah, Don't work hard. That's, That's right. It. Easy. Mm-hmm. E- I do love that you're a very logical person and a yeah. massive G.I. Joe fan because yep. knowing is half the battle. Boom, nailed it. The other half is violence. Yeah. Um, right. So, <laughs> you- <laughs> so G.I. Joe, pretty much out the gate. That's pretty good. Yeah, I think the very first thing I actually did was an HBO show called Treme. Nice. Um just a little, you know, part in, in a bar or something, nothing major. Right. But, uh, immediately started getting into the action stuff with like Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter and this Nicolas Cage movie called Stolen where I did SWAT and then uh, 21 Jump Street. Immediately it went into the cop action uh, genre pretty quickly. Sure. Because that's just where I fit in based on my look. And you hadn't done anything like tactical before this? You just no, had the look and they're not. like, give him a yeah. gun, it'll work. Yep. Give him a gun assuming... Yeah, <laughs> because even on sets, directors would come up to me and say, "Well, how would we, how would we do this?" Asking me about how, because I don't fucking know. Sure, <laughs> no, sure. I'm not really a cop, right? <laughs> They're like, "You're not." I'm like, "No, no." Or they'll come up and say, uh, "How'd you guys do this in Iraq when I were a soldier?" I don't know. I wasn't. Yeah. Wasn't in Iraq, you know. <laughs> but after a while, um, you know, the directors come and go, but the uh, the crews are all pretty local crews. So after a while, you get to know the crews. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, after a while they get to know me and, you know, what I know, what I don't know, and if I can be trusted with certain tasks. And sure. after a while, I get to actually know how to use an M4 or an AR-15 or how to handcuff somebody properly. Right. Just from, you know, on-the-job experience. And to be honest with you, I did watch a lot of cops. Sure, sure. <laughs> Why not? Just to see how things were done. Research. Yep, exactly. It really was. Yeah. And, uh in 2014, there was this movie called The Whole Truth with uh, Keanu Reeves. Yeah. So I got a call for that one. I said, hey, John, can you give us two weeks as a bailiff? I said, sure. So I called me in, went in there. The director said, you know what? You're, you're very intense. I said, yep. She says, <laughs> I think you could do a uh, prosecutor. I said, absolutely, I could do that. Yeah. No idea what I'm 
fucking talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Always say yes. Always <laughs> yes. say yes. He said, forget the bailiff. Let's make you the assassin prosecutor. Yeah, it's there you go. Terrible. So went with that and, uh, you know, BS my way through that one. Made it work. <laughs> Great experience. So if you go watch the whole truth, <laughs> Keanu's a defense attorney. And I'm the assistant prosecutor. There you go. I mean, again, to be fair, just, that is uh, acting. You know? Yeah. <laughs> just fake yeah. it. <laughs> fake it to make it. Pulled it off. You, you did. Know? And uh, <laughs> when I got home from that meeting, I went to uh, my neighbor's house, who's a, a lawyer, and said, I need your help. Can I borrow you for like two hours? Yeah. I, I signed up as an attorney, and I have no idea what I'm doing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So if you ever go watch back and watch that movie, The Whole Truth, it's on cable right now because a lot of people are texting me and sending me messages that it's on. Love it. But uh, I'm in there as a prosecutor. It's a good time. That's amazing. So yeah. they're assuming that you're a cop in like ex-military, so they give you all these things. Is that how you got into stunts as well? They're like, you look like a stunt guy. Put this on. Yeah. Well, it started small, you know. Uh-huh. And uh, Louisiana is not New York or L.A. Ah. Way, way, way more easygoing. I mean, and back then, 10 years ago, whatever, they were way more easygoing than they are even now because they've tightened up a lot. Sure. And they would say, exactly, hey, look like a cop, here's a gun, go jump, there's going to be an explosion. We'll right. More. Okay, thanks. <laughs> it's kind of on the job training. And, uh, but again, I mean, I'm not a full blown stuntman. I don't jump off buildings and right. set myself on fire. Just a lot of shootouts, a lot of dying, a lot of getting stabbed. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, but you figure it out. Yeah. Uh, the squibs, you know, they put squibs on you and set those off. Oh, is that cool? It feels like a paintball. Have you ever been shot with a paintball? Oh, that hurts. That's, yeah. I mean, it doesn't feel good, but it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't hurt. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Is it, it's remote controlled. I was just about Little, to ask how yeah. that's done. Oh. Yeah. So uh, it was like this Van Damme movie I did where Van Damme shoots me in the back. Amazing. But it's choreographed. You know, he says, okay, he's got five shots in his gun. You're going to hear pop, pop, pop. Pop, pop. And on the third one, you're going to, the script's going to go off, you're going to go down. Right. You do so many takes without the script, you know, and there's only one with it. Oh. So. Interesting. Yeah. So, how, yeah. how many times have you died? A lot. I have a pretty impressive <laughs> resume of who I've been killed by at this point. Yeah? Let's hear him. Yep. Let's hear him. <laughs> yeah, let's hear him. What you got? Well, I had, when I met with the producer for Logan, uh, he asked me to bring a resume. <laughs> Perfect. And uh, I had a whole spiel. I don't remember it now. But I said, well, I, I've been killed by the raptors of Jurassic World, fought the armies of Planet of the Apes, been killed by Cobra, and I've been killed by Laura and Logan. Uh-huh. Um, shit. <laughs> 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 trying to think. Uh, There's so many. Key, Key from Key and Peele in the movie Keanu. Oh, sweet. That. Yeah. There's more. I really have to look at the resume. It's a lot. Uh, yeah, it is. What's the key to dying? <laughs> give me give me your insider pro tip. Well, you know, um, being shot, what they told me is uh, the first time he said, imagine being hit with a spiked hammer. Oh. That's your motivation. So, you know, now I'm producing and directing my own stuff, and I, uh -huh. this girl I work with, I just gave her the exact same metaphor because she never died on camera before. Right. And I said, just imagine somebody whacking you right here in the chest with a spiked hammer. How would your body react to that? Sure. It's going to be like a really sharp punch. You're going to wince, and you're going to turn with it you know that was the advice they gave me and that's what i've gone with right okay makes sense yeah it does i like it i like yeah. it i'm fairly certain i've seen pictures of the prosthetic you had for logan the one with your like gut all cut up yeah that's pretty cool yeah and i mean when you watch that movie i mean you can't tell because i got a mask on and stuff and we did three days on that and of course it all gets chopped up yeah of course of course so but hey movie. regardless the uh the experience was awesome, and that's a, if I have one complaint about film, that's what I hate. It's as if you go to London, you go to Europe for a month, and you're only allowed to bring back a postcard of the Eiffel Tower and say, "Here's my trip." Right. You know, unless you're talking or working with somebody who works in film, they will never ever truly understand what the experience is, and true. I hate that. Yeah, it's true. I'll come back and tell my wife. She'd say, "Did you have fun today?" And I'll tell her all about it. She has no idea what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then the movie comes out, and it's like, "Wait a minute! You said this scene had this and this and that." It's like, "Well, they cut it." Right, right. Yeah, that's that's my biggest fear is in the mm -hmm. same way that you, uh, like G.I. Joe was the thing, you're like, all I want to do is be in this. I'm the same way with Star Wars, obviously. Right. Mm -hmm. And my biggest fear is working on Star Wars and then getting cut because then I'm that crazy person that's like, I did it, I did it. I swear yep. I did it. <laughs> yep. And, you know, that's the reality is that 99.5% of what is filmed never makes it out. It's very true. 
Hell, even <laughs> scenes. Like, scenes with dialogue and characters get cut out of movies. It's crazy. Yep. And, you know, now that, uh, like I said, I've been uh, directing and producing my own stuff for going on three years this summer. Yeah. I- I've always understood the logic, but mm. now I'm living it. Right. Where we'll shoot 13 hours of something for a 30-minute short. Mm-hmm. You know, and then there's obviously I got people to come in and help out and uh, I have to cut their scenes because it just doesn't work. I'll have a drone guy come out, beautiful shots, but if they don't work, they don't work. That's true. That's so true. I totally get it now. I mean, I got it before. Now I now I get it. Really get it. Yeah. Now you've had to do it and you're like, oh, yep, and it sucks. Yeah. And it's disappointing. <laughs> but I always offer them their footage. There you go. You know, hey, I've got to cut cool. this, but your footage is yours. That's you own cool. That. Yeah. Man, is it, do you find that your brain is like better worked in the producer role because there's so many different things? Um, it's I, I think I'm more comfortable in that role just yeah. based on my normal life. Mm-hmm. You know, you you give me a business and I'll I'll analyze it for you know two or three months. Sure, I'll analyze the people and say, okay, here's the goal, here's the resources we have to work with, how do I make this happen? I'll make it happen. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not going to lose. I just got to figure out how to win. Sure. And uh, the same thing with independent film now is, uh, you know, all of our projects, I mean, they look like they cost a lot of money, mm-hmm. but they don't because That's we have key. such we have such a, a handle on our resources. So when I write, I write based on knowing what I have access to. Sure. That makes I have sense. Access, yep. I have access to police uniforms. I have access to this campground, uh, free rain with a river. I've got access to this. I've got access to that. So cool. Let me write the story based on that. Because I could write a great story about an aircraft carrier. It's just never going to be made. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that you know that's a that's good advice too for people mm-hmm. that like want to do their own indie stuff. It's like use what you have because yes. otherwise, what are you doing? Exactly. And it goes back to the writing advice. Write what you know. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So I'm, I'm you know, I, I I cut back dramatically on doing a. When I decided to. Uh, Go more the indie route. I, I really cut back on anything big. I mean, I haven't even done a TV show, a big TV show besides NCS New Orleans in mm-hmm. probably two years. Sure. And because I'm putting all of my my resources and my effort and my learning into indies, there you go. And just getting really involved with the indie scene here. So uh, I love it. I know everybody, and we all help each other out. And you know, some guys are better than others, and everybody's at a different path. So uh, I have a buddy named Frank Wilson who actually called me yesterday, and he said, "Hey, I have this story." that I've written, would you would you read it? So I read the story. He said, what do you think? I said, it, uh, it's a cool little story. I think you could easily do it. We had very similar conversation to what we're having now, mm-hmm. where he's never done anything. Right. And I suggest, dude, you got to you gotta start small. Yeah. You got to start small, because every single person I've seen say, no, I'm going to go make a movie. They jump into a two-hour movie with, you know, and they spend a, thousands of dollars on it until oh, they yeah. discover... I have no idea what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. It just starts with, <laughs> in a post-apocalyptic world, you're like, no, 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 mm-hmm. back, 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 in a, in a living room. Let's do this. Right. <laughs> Start small. So you've watched my silly little Pop-Tart videos. Yeah, they're amazing. Okay, thank you. But that was the logic, you know. I would do those with my son as a goof with Love an it. iPhone camera, and they were always little two-minute bits, and it was never anything more than the same joke told different ways. Right. But it was so I had something to edit. It was something I had something to play with. Practice. It's exactly what it was. And then uh, threw them out there. It's a relatable joke if you're a parent. Of course. And uh, so from there, I after I don't know about a year, or so I kind of retired the idea. Okay, it's time to move on to something else. Mm-hmm. And then I went on to a, a set um, called Tenet Noctis, I think it was about the Crusades. Oh, sweet. Yep. And I was uh, playing an Arab, and I had all my swords and armor and stuff, and. Uh, we were shooting at a Renaissance fairgrounds, so a pretty legit, oh, you know, cool. looking, uh, yeah, bloody looking set. So while they were filming other stuff, I just went to go wander around, you know, to check out the uh, the fairgrounds. Yeah, and uh, somebody said, "Hey, let's film a pop tart adventure." They gave me a box of crafting. We filmed a little skit <laughs> in a cool location and cool outfits. And then we did again. I went on to another set called Digger Apocalyptic, and somebody again said, "Hey, let's do a pop tart skit." Okay, you guys are having fun with it. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> And then uh, I was on NCIS New Orleans in full squat gear. And uh, somebody says, hey, let's do one. Okay, so we did an art squat gear on NCIS New Orleans. So, you know, I forget that I put this stuff out there and people watch it. Right. You know, so when they see me, they're like, hey, let's do this. Sure. And, uh, the Pop-Tart guy. <laughs> yeah, you're the Pop-Tart guy. <laughs> so it became known as, I don't even like Pop-Tarts. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> Do you really not? I really don't care for them. I'll, I'll eat one maybe every six months, but it was just a joke and uh, – that is Made hilarious. people laugh. <laughs> but what I've realized as I analyze all this, it's like, all right, this is stupid. 
I'm getting what I need, which is experience. Right. People are having fun with it. The views were up to, you know, seven, eight, ten thousand views on one of these stupid videos. Goodness. Yeah. And without trying very hard, never paid for an ad, you know, just started happening on its own. I Good said, for okay, you. Yeah, thank you. But I, I market a lot. And if you follow me on Facebook or Instagram, I constantly marketing and getting stuff out there. You know? Yeah, it's smart. You have to. Nobody's going to do it for you. Yeah, I'm and, learning that uh, the hard way. Ugh, <laughs> you have to. It's the worst. And uh, so I said, all right, I got what I want. I have a story, not necessarily the story I want, but uh, has viewers and has followers. What do I do with this now? Right. So I said, all right, the next step is I'm, in, I'm going to write a Pop-Tart adventure instead of just ad-libbing it. We're gonna write, I'm going to write one five minutes long specifically to be filmed, shot, so I can get some practice. Nice. So uh, I wrote a little one, again, based on what I know I had access to. So I have a buddy named Jason Stanley who looks exactly like Jason Statham. <laughs> <laughs> so we met, strangely enough, we met on a Christian Mingle commercial, I believe. Amazing. And uh, yeah, so we stayed in touch and I called him up, but we weren't really friends. And I called him and I said, hey, Jason, how you doing? And yeah, everything's cool. And I said, hey, I'm writing these little skits. He says, yeah, I see him. I said, I'd like to write one and I'd like you to be in it if you're, if you're up for it. And he said, well, what is it? And I told him it's a Pop-Tart adventure regarding Jason Statham from The Expendables <laughs> called Christmas in the Park. I went to a public park. You know, and we filmed this five-minute skit and uh, about pop tarts, and it's pretty funny actually. But I took it home and I figured it out. And I also learned, you know, I figured, hey, we'll be done in an hour, hour and a half. Oh God, we're out there oh. six hours. Yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but you put yourself in that situation, and you're going to learn. Yeah, absolutely. You what no you choice. do with that knowledge, right? What you do with that knowledge is up to you. Mm -hmm. But you're going to learn. So I learned. Okay, allow ten times the length of time you need. You think you need at least. I also learned. Have water. <laughs> oh. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was completely unprepared. So now we have for a couple yeah. hours. Yeah. I learned how to plan backup plans because the camera guy I was planning. We just shot my little point and click cannon. Mm -hmm. My camera guy bailed out last minute. Oh, no. So I learned, okay, now let's have a backup plan. Yeah. So we put it out there. It was pretty funny. And then I opened up on my Facebook page. I said, hey, guys, any of my Hollywood South pals want to be in my next Pop Tart adventure? Holy shit, the floodgates opened up. Really? I know everybody, yeah. <laughs> sure. And I said, I'm, I, I'm a pop culture guy, so I'm going with pop culture. So I have a buddy named Michael Anglin, who's my partner now. He looks like the T-1000 from Terminator. He says, hey, I, I get told all the time I look like a T-1000, so I wrote a skit based around that. Nice. When we were filming it, it got rained out, and uh, Jason Stanley called me back. He says, I can do a killer Jim Carrey um, fire marshal Bill Burns. So we went back and did a Bill Burns skit. was pretty funny. Yeah. The Terminator one. But as I'm doing this, I said, the only thing that I ask is if we're going to do this, it is a group effort. You know, I'll, I'll take the lead and I'll, I'll provide as much as I can. But if you're going to be involved, all I ask is, hey, bring a case of waters, bring a bag of ice. Right. Any resources you have, please, everybody chip in. It's not the John show. It's all about us getting better and growing together. Mm -hmm. As hippie-ish as that may sound. So uh, on the Terminator skit, we did a buddy of mine named Charlie Barber, who I still work with to this day. Um, he says, well, my buddy's got this private campground like 20 minutes away. He said, we can use it. Just clean up your mess. Like 150 acres. Nice. Oh, cool. so then when we got there, Charlie also had his ATV. I bought a little steady cam for my iPhone. We got on the back of the ATV, had steady cam shots. I mean, we just started Dude. putting our heads together and we started, you know, excelling quickly. So uh, looking for the next idea, I said, all right, well, if you're going to do pop culture skits, you have to have Star Wars. That's so, true. Uh, I wrote a skit based around a stormtrooper myself because I can pass as a second, third generation clone. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. And uh, my buddy John Mangus as an Imperial Commander and Darth Vader. The basic idea of this skit was about a stormtrooper who gets starstruck meeting Vader while serving <laughs> him breakfast. Love you it. You know, stupid stuff, but. Yeah, why not? It, it, it's you got to grow. So then I realized, hmm, hey, John, you don't have a Darth Vader outfit. I used to in my movie room. We used to have one on, uh, a Ruby's one on a mannequin. Nice. But uh, I don't have a Stormtrooper. I don't have an Imperial Commander. But John Mangus was part of the 501st because he's done Darth Maul stuff for Disney. Mm -hmm. He's an actor also. And uh, so I wrote this little five-minute skit, started making the connections to get the outfits that I needed. And as I did this, um, coincidentally, I had did a fan film a Star Wars fan film around the same time I was doing this or writing this. Perfect. And uh, so I made some connections with the 501st and I said, can we get a couple stormtroopers? And I ended up with dozens of stormtroopers. And then another gentleman I met where I met you, a guy named Felix, he had a C-3PO and an R2-D2. Yeah. Yep. So he came out from Florida and I had a Boba Fett and suddenly I said, I got to rewrite this thing. 
And at some point we had to stop and we got to put the brakes on. This thing's getting too big. <laughs> sure. So uh, it went, I said, okay, iPhone days are over. I have to bring in a real camera crew now and we're going to do this quote right. Mm -hmm. So it went from a three minute skit to like a 40 minute skit. Dude. To this day, two and a half years later, it's still not done because the effects are such a pain in the ass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what I learned on that one is all in all, when it was done, it took us six months to film, mm -hmm. 150 people, 13 hours of footage, and it's done. But the problem that I have that I'm still struggling with to this day is because with a fan film, of course, you can't make any money. Nobody can right. pay it. That's the rule because you did a fan film yourself, if I recall. Yep. Same thing. And Copyright's so that's cool. Copyright's got to be free. Yep. So... Uh, 501st, of course, did it for free. Um, we did a go GoFundMe. I think the whole thing cost like $2,500. Nice. Um, but And it's a comedy. The, the basic story is still the same about a stormtrooper that gets awestruck by meeting Darth Vader. And yeah. I'll send you some footage behind the scenes so you can watch it. Cool. Um, but the special effects, because if you're going to put out a fan film, the effects have to be legit. Yeah, true. So uh, that that's my only requirement. We can put, I, people say it's taking too long. You're right. It is taking way too long. <laughs> but... I could put something out in a week and it's going to look like absolute garbage. You're going to say this sucks. Right. Or we take our time. It's okay. Life goes on. And when it comes out, it's going to look freaking awesome. Yeah. So uh, I have a buddy that works for a local ABC affiliate and he follows me on Instagram. And, and uh, I said, hey, uh, his name's Kurt. Kurt, we're filming the Star Wars thing. He says, yeah, I'm watching you guys. What are you doing? It's wild. And I said, well, we're filming this fan film. Would you like to come out? So he came out and he did a, an interview with us and put it on national news. Nice. And somebody in New York saw it and he called me <laughs> and he said, hey, I'm on, I saw this news story pop up and uh, how can I help with effects? No way. So, yeah. So he's been helping with effects. He's a full-blown industry guy. So he's been helping with effects. But again, it's volunteer. So it's at his time and, and generosity, you know, that right. he can crank stuff out. So I'll show you some of the effects he's done. I mean, they're amazing. Oh, that's so cool. But you got to wait. <laughs> yeah. Know, I can't call him up and say, where's my effects? Right, right. Do you find that, it, are you able to sort of like, because the, the thing is that stops a lot of people from trying, I've learned, is like the fear of failure, you know? Yes. So it's like, if you do something and it doesn't quite work out the way that you plan for a number mm -hmm. of reasons, are you good at letting that go and just chalking it up to learning and moving on? Absolutely. Yeah. That is, that's how you learn is to failure. Sure. You're going to fail. You're going to fail. You're going to make mistakes. But the balance to that is flexibility. Go in there and have 15 backup plans, you know, yeah. and uh, you have to have 15 backup plans and don't assume everything's going to work. Yeah. You know, because, you know, uh, you go in with one idea and you're going to end up with a completely different product or end result because things happen, you know. Right. What what was the original Star Wars called? You know, the Adventures of Luke Starkiller, Journal of the Wills. Yeah, yeah. That's not what you ended up with. That's true. You know? That's true. But you cannot also be surrounded by yes men. So I, I write uh -huh. this stuff, and then I have my two buddies from California, one a friend of over 40 years and one a friend of about 30 years. Nice. I write my stuff, and then I bounce it off them, and they have no problem telling me, yeah. this is great, <laughs> this is awful. Right. What do you think of this? So if you're watching my stuff, you'll see my name is the writing credit. You'll see a guy named Francisco Rojas and a guy named Mike Heron. Mm -hmm. They keep me in check because if you don't do that, you end up with episode one. Oh, you mean a right? masterpiece? <laughs> right. Well, nobody would tell George Lucas this is awful. Oh, my goodness gracious. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> do you – so was that was that something that you learned or you like – because a, a lot of people don't do it well. So did you – get through the failures and learn to let it go? Or were you just able to do that from the get-go with your experience doing like restaurant stuff? Yeah, I mean, I've run restaurant stuff and internet stuff, and I've had a couple different businesses throughout my life. And uh, when you're self-employed, it's literally feast or famine. Right. Things are either going really well or they're going really bad. Very seldom is it in the middle. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, these businesses that I've had throughout my life, you know, there's times when they're rocking and rolling, and then times when the bottom completely crashes out. You're like, okay, shit, I didn't, ex I didn't see that coming. Right. How do I get out of it? Because nobody's coming to save me. Right. It's all on you. Know? you. It's like freelance. It's all on me. Exactly. If I want to eat, you're going to have to work harder. If I'm out of money, we're going to have to figure something out. You know. So I, I have no problem with making mistakes. I have no problem with falling down on my face and getting up and say, okay, what, what did I do right? What did I do wrong? And how am I better tomorrow? Sure. And I ask myself that every day You know, um, about everything in my life. You know, Am I a good husband? Am I doing this right? Am I doing that wrong? Mm -hmm. And... You know, the hardest thing in life is to be honest with yourself because yeah. I can easily blame everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but True. you got to check your ego and say, I make mistakes. Right. What is truly my fault? Okay, it rained. I had no control over that. 
True. How do I recover from this? Okay, we're going to have add another day on to make up for that. Or we're going to film around it. We're going to sit here and wait for the rain to pass. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I have no problem with making mistakes. You just got to keep it's on expected. moving. Mm-hmm. It's expected. And in the moment, uh, well, here's the other thing. Part of being a boss already is that uh, you have to be okay with being the bad guy. And Ooh, uh, That's good advice. Yeah. So, you know, a, a couple examples from Hopeless, uh, the Star Wars thing is, uh, mm-hmm. you know, we, we got to this scene. I don't want to tell you the scene. We got this particular scene and it wasn't working. Mm-hmm. And we had, you know, probably 12 people in the scene and then the crew around and me and then Michael is my my uh, my partner and then our camera guy, uh, DP named Chad. And we're trying to figure this out and all the voices are chiming in, all with good intentions. Right. And you're trying to appease everybody. And finally I said, you know what? we got to walk away. So me and Mike and Chad walked away and said, here's what we're going to do. Come back. Here's what we're doing, guys. Not everybody agrees with it. That's okay. Mm-hmm. We have we can't sit here for 40 hours and have a council. we got to make a five-minute decision. And, and, and if it blows up and it sucks, hey, it's on me. Mm-hmm. My fault. But if it works out, hey, cool. It works out. I don't care. Let's keep going. So that's what I mean by being the bad guy. And then also this other scene in Hopeless where uh, we really needed a lot of extras for this one day. Uh, probably about 30. So we got a lot of volunteers, which is great. Mm-hmm. But, you know, they're doing it as a volunteer for a five, for a Star Wars fan film. Right. So you're absolutely 100% appreciative of, a, of them being there. But, you know, in this particular case, we had a lot of people smiling and, uh, you know, goofing off. And I said, hey, guys, um, don't want to be an man. asshole. However, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, <laughs> the audience is only going to take this as seriously as we are. Right. I appreciate you being here. Glad to have you. However, um, you're in a fire. I, I, you're in a fire. Exactly. You're in a battle. You're not yeah. laughing. You're not smiling. You know, uh, these actors have come in are doing me a favor, uh, doing me a favor right. by being here, you know, cause I went out of my way to find the best local actors to help me mm-hmm. and, uh, they're, they're killing it. Um, but they're surrounded by people goofing off and if it's not going to work, cool. Maybe put you in a different scene. If you need a break, go take a break or you got to stop smiling and goofing off. And, uh, you know, I, I said that in the nicest possible way, but if you don't know me, I do look mean. Right. I, mean, I really upset, <laughs> I really upset a couple of people and that wasn't the goal. Right. It's just but, your face, uh, John. It is my face. <laughs> you know, if you don't know me and it was hot out there and I was uncomfortable. Right. But that's what I mean by sometimes you have to be the bad guy and definitely not the intention. But, you know, in, in my somewhat defense behind the scenes, I've put in already at this point, hundreds, if not thousands of hours to making this thing work. Right. And. I've, there's a lot of logistics that go into getting the actors and the equipment and everything out there mm-hmm. and making it work. And I cannot afford to lose time and have it screwed up. It's true. That's, <laughs> it I is mean, true. You're, you're right. You're mm-hmm. right. You can't argue with it. And if you are, then maybe you, this isn't the place for you. Yeah. Right. No offense. <laughs> I mean, it's a thing. You're trying to get stuff done. Do mm-hmm. you do you find that it's harder to wrangle like a different type of business versus like a set, or do you think they translate pretty well? No, people are people, and thankfully there's only so many different personalities in the world. Right. So, you know, there's it's very rare that I come upon a personality that I've never met before. Uh-huh. And my intentions are never um, to be an asshole or to lash out or be unreasonable. I'll always listen, you know, to what, what people have to say. Mm-hmm. I'll always take input. And if I'm wrong or I'm wrong, I'm always open to suggestions. But at some point you got to make a decision. And if it works out, great. If it doesn't, it's on me. Yeah. I'm making the wrong decision. So uh, in the case of um, Hopeless, again, for example, um, I had a gentleman who was in it named Nathan Smith, playing Imperial Commander. He's got a big beard. Mm-hmm. He was actually at that show also as a comic book artist where uh, I met you. And he came up to me oh, and he cool. remembered me from something. It turned out that we had worked on, I think, Terminator together and didn't know it. And, and uh, we started talking, formed a friendship, and he lived in uh, – Mobile, and I'm just outside New Orleans. Mm-hmm. So uh, at the time, I was doing a lot of comic conventions, you know. Right. And uh, he was doing them as a comic book artist. So we were doing a show called MobyCon. Maybe you're familiar with it. Mm-hmm. MobyCon, a couple years ago, right before I did Hopeless, and he and I hung out at the show, and then afterward, we went out to Waffle House and sat there all night and talked. Nice. And I was telling him about this idea, and as I'm talking to him, I said, my God, I can see you with a Rebel Fleet Commander's helmet on. Would you like to be in this? Mm-hmm. And he said, yeah. So, you know, I gave him the script and all that. And uh, he looked at it and he said, um, yeah, I like this speech that my character is giving, but it doesn't flow easily for me. Do you mind if I reorganize it and, and get the same point? Said, Absolutely. Whatever works for you, dude. Right. As long as the points hit. So, 
And then also he helped me write a scene with a female commander. I won't tell you the scene. I'll show it to you behind the scenes. I don't cool. give it away. Yeah. But he and I, he came down for an audition in New Orleans. He was driving back to Mobile, and he would always call me. We go to PF, not PF Chang's, uh, Panda Express. Nice. And have lunch. So we went and had lunch. So I showed him the latest script, and he said, I like this scene. But he said, uh, you think you can get a Boba Fett? And I said, yep. Ooh. He says, here's an idea. So he, he wrote that whole scene for me. Oh, cool. And, uh, but anytime I write anything, I say to these guys, hey, take a look. If something doesn't work for you, let me know. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to elaborate or change it, I'm completely open to feedback. The only thing that uh, is usually pretty firm is, uh, you know, there is a point to that sentence or a point to that line. Right. You got to keep that point intact. Um, or sometimes, you know, the camera guys want to try, uh, let's try this. Hey, right. you know, let's do two or three thoughts, you know, the more the better. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So. That's pretty cool. That's pretty yeah, cool. people are people. And you, you treat people well, you talk to them like human beings, and you listen to them. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. I'm above nobody and I'm below nobody. You know? I, I think that's what makes a good captain, really, is that mm -hmm. you can listen but also have a clear vision and kind of corral all those personalities into the bigger idea. Right. It's a lot to take on. Yeah. Again, uh, you just got to check your ego at the door. Sure. And uh, you start off with, uh, with a meeting. Hey, guys, gather around. Here is our plan for the day so everybody knows what's going on. Right. Here is our plan. And... Uh, if the plan changes, again, you call everybody out and say, here's the plan and here's what we're doing. So everybody knows that there's somebody in charge. Right. You know? right. If you have needs, please stop me. You know, you're getting hot. You need a drink, whatever you need, you need to leave. Cool. Just let me know and we'll work around it. And But I need to have the information of what I'm working with. And I, again, I need to know the resources right. that we're working with to accomplish our goal. Makes sense. Yeah. My brain just doesn't work that way. I've tried. Oh. <laughs> I've thought. I've thought about it. I'm like, okay, like, because you're doing so. You're so many things at once. Like, yes. I remember growing up. I was like, you know, I, I wanted to be an actor my entire life. But then I was like, maybe, maybe I'll try to be a director. And then when mm -hmm. I started actually working, in like on different sets, I was like, there's no way in hell I could be a director. They're doing like 50 <laughs> things at once. <laughs> yeah. Blue or well, red. I have a nice case I don't know, of like uh, ADD, both. so that helps. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it really does. I mean, that, that, that is a joke, but it's really not a joke. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I can handle a lot of things at once, and nothing phases me. Besides somebody walking me up walking up to me and shooting me in the face, right, I yeah. can handle pretty much anything. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and even that, it'll just take you a second to get, get recalculated. <laughs> right. I don't need that here. Yeah, please. You got two for a reason. Yep. That's crazy. So, wait. Well, hold on. Did you say you moved to New Orleans in 02? Yes. Because Katrina happened in 05. Yes. How was that? Awful. <laughs> Man. So in that three-year span uh, where I lived here for, you know, first three years, there were hurricane scares where we would evacuate. Yeah. And even when uh, Hurricane Katrina was coming, we weren't planning on leaving. I said to my wife, my wife, we're not going anywhere. Yeah, yeah. So then as we're watching this storm just get bigger and bigger, and soon it's bigger than the state, and we're still not ready to go. Yeah. And then uh, by the time we started taking it seriously— um, I, I had bags of fertilizer and I started using those as sandbags and, you know, nice butting up the door and, mm -hmm. you know, the windows and all that. And then, uh, we had like a big window in the front of the house and I put a really big dining room table in front of it. And I said, okay, if the house should come down, we'll go, I'll get in this table. We can go out the window, you know? And then I parked the car really close to the house and I said, okay, if the house, if the car flies, It'll have six inches to hit the house, not six feet. Right. Then I said, what the hell are we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> like, what's going on you here? Know, right, why are we, if we're having these kind of thoughts, maybe we better leave. So we left the next day. And uh, the fun, I mean, I guess the one funny thing is uh, we had just bought a car that weekend, a brand new car. And uh, we, we, we evacuated to Tuscaloosa. Uh, mm -hmm. And we were gone for, I think, two weeks or so. <laughs> but they never got a chance to process like the car payments. It was like two months before they even had a record of us having this car. Nice. And uh, so no payments. But uh, yeah, that that's why I learned to text because oh. the phone lines went down. And you know we didn't have iPhones like we did now. You had to if you want to press an A, you're gonna have to have the number hit the number two three times or whatever. Right. And that's how I learned to text because that was the only form of communication. And the the banking system went down. So um, I'm an '80s kid where we worried about the end of the world and, and nuclear right. war and all that. <laughs> so I mean, besides being in Tuscaloosa where we were functional. Our personal lives completely went down, and, and my father-in-law and I came back after about a week or so to just kind of assess, and uh, you don't know what absolute silence is until you hear absolute silence. Right. 
you don't realize all the background noise in our lives, whether it's air conditioning or TV or whatever. It's true. We came back. I mean, I, I, now thankfully we live on what's called the North Shore, north of Lake Pontchartrain. Mm-hmm. So we didn't have the flooding like they did, but we have a, a lot of pine trees and the trees were down in the millions. I mean, they cut through oh. houses and landed on cars and we got off with minimal damage. Um, but yeah, it, it was not a pleasant time. Jeez. Yep. That's terrible. A, it's crazy to think, like, I like to look back on, like, the full scope of stories, you know? Mm-hmm. So when you think about, like, all these cool things that you've done, this was all after that. Oh, yeah. this My story in film didn't begin until 2011, so it went on 10 years now. That's crazy. Mm-hmm. Like, when you look back, it's like life can take such a turn, like, in either yeah. way, and mm-hmm. you just never see it coming. So you had, like, the pendulum swing that way, and then it swung this way. Yep. And, not, and in the midst of this was when you got sick. It's yes. crazy. Yep. So then, uh, yeah, all that. But again, you, you, it's all how you look at it, though, you know. Yeah, it's you all cannot, perspective. You cannot appreciate the good times unless you experience the bad. I agree. Totally agree. So, yeah, you, you, so that's how I look at it. It's all how you look at it. Man. Nuts. I, I, mm-hmm. I love that. I also, I have this thing where, like, I don't know, there's like a like a frequency of people who've been through some terrible things mm-hmm. that get through them. That on the other side of it, people who've also struggled, you kind of have this like, I, like maybe respect is the right word, mm-hmm. where you're like, oh, I see it. You know what I mean? Like you've struggled, I've struggled. We kind of, yeah. it's this way to connect where like you don't want to connect on that level. It's like when you lose somebody and mm-hmm. somebody else loses somebody, you're like, I get it. I see yeah. you. I totally get it. And, uh, you know, I, I'm a cancer survivor. And, uh, to Amazing. this day, I still volunteer. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't, I, all I did was not die. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's hard sometimes really. Oh, it's awful. And, uh, it was brutal and I, I fully expected to die and I prepared myself to die. But to this day, I still volunteer with a couple of organizations and every day I, I work with somebody, whether it's a text or a Facebook message or a phone call to help people that were in the situation I was in because they have all the same questions I had. And that's what I needed at the time. Sure. So my, my lease on life is, hey, cool, I'm here. I'm going to use that experience to help other people. But going back to your point, um, I can talk to anybody who's going through cancer right now, and I will automatically, without knowing this person, have a bond with them that I do not have with my wife. Sure. You know, it's because if you take a Vietnam vet and put to, together with a World War II vet, they don't know each other, but they have a shared experience that unless you've been there, you can't understand. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. So, Dude, you beat cancer. That's pretty amazing. As yeah. as, as far as things that human beings so can do. That's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that knock on wood. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, <laughs> so in, wait, hold on. In the mid, So you moved to New Orleans. Katrina happened. Did you get mm-hmm. sick while this film stuff was going on? Oh, yeah. I, I uh, was diagnosed with cancer and... Uh, February 2014, Dude. Had, had surgery, didn't need a chemo, went through surgery, that sucked, and then uh, had a great run after that, and that's when I did like Jurassic World, The Whole Truth, right? and then uh, got re, uh, re, re, a recurrence in October 2014. No way. And yeah, yeah, and like six months later, during my next scan, and then uh, I said, all right, this sucks, and he says, well, let's plan on starting in January 2015. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so we started, I mean, I said, okay, between now and then I'm going to just have the best time I can do all this work and Hell have yeah. some experiences. And then I did it. I figured that, okay, I'll just go have chemo and resume my life. But no, it doesn't work that way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't work that way. It was very, very heartbreaking. And, uh, how that applies to film is that, uh, you know, a lot of my buddies were checking in on me and one guy said, man, I went to a casting something for something. And there was a picture of you cause they always call me. There's mm-hmm. a picture of you on the wall. And there was a post-it on it and said, don't call John. And he's sick right now. Oh, man. And he told me that. And it was very heartbreaking because I, I felt left out. And But they were looking out for me, you know. But it was yeah. heartbreaking. Like, sure. man, they wanted to call me, but they couldn't. Yeah. It's like the double-edged sword of like, that's mm-hmm. really cool. But also, yeah. come on. Fucked up, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's pretty nuts. Was there was there a part yeah. of your brain? Because like, I, my mom beat breast cancer. So I mm-hmm. think about that, like, is there something in your brain, because this is post-G.I. Joe. Oh, yeah, yeah. So you peaked early as far as, like, your dream job goes. You're, like, right out mm-hmm. the gate, boom, you got this. And then it was, like, the the law of equivalent exchange almost. And then you beat the hell yeah. out of that, too. That's mm-hmm. so that's cool. Well, you know, 2014, I, I have a great wife and nice life, personal life. Life's good all around, you know. Yeah. 
And I, I don't do anything, quote, wrong. I don't do drugs. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I eat like garbage, but, yeah. you know. <laughs> you got to have something. Um, yeah, that's my one vice. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I don't do anything wrong. You know, I, I, I have my work, and I come home, and I'm in bed every night, and I'm here for my kids. I'm here for my wife and, you know, responsible person. And it's like, okay, what did I do wrong? Because, you know, I have a brother who drinks a lot and, you know, has done some drugs and all that, but he's sure. healthy as a horse. Right, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I just, you, you can't really, I, I can't, I, I went through the, phase of asking, how did this happen? What did I do wrong? Of course. And uh, ultimately, I just concluded, okay, well, that's just the price of living in the modern world. I'm talking to you in an iPhone right now. Right. You know, I yeah. guarantee you it's killing me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've thought about that. Like 50 years from now, they're like, they used to put mm-hmm. them up against yeah. their faces? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. You know, doctors used to say smoking was good for you. That's and, true. Uh, I drank a bottle of water today from a plastic bottle. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's microplastics. <laughs> yep. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm sitting here leaning against a, on a, my plastic office chair, you know. Right. Plastic glasses on my head. You know, is... I'm sure all of this. Is <laughs> <honest>. <laughs> that's why we. That's why we have to have fun in the meantime. Exactly. There's no getting out of it. That's our price, in my opinion, for living in the modern world. Some dude living up on the top of the Andes Mountains with no modern luxuries. Pretty sure he's not dying of cancer. That's a good point. <laughs> that's a very good point. Oh man. Do you, so. Then yeah. what? Do, battling cancer. Do you think? There's obviously the physical side of it, right? Mm-hmm. How yes. much play does the mental side of it come into? Because I, okay. can't, I can't imagine. Well, um, and you're 100% spot on because uh, you got a lot of time to think. Yeah, I bet. I bet. <laughs> when you're laying there. And I'm a pretty physical dude. Like I, I'm always doing something. I'm always working. I'm always moving around. And and the thought of saying, oh, I'm going to be in bed for a week sounds great until you actually do it. Right. When you're in bed for months and you just can't function and – you know, I used to go to the gym pretty regularly, and again, not buff, but, you know, decent. Right. And uh, the first thing I lost was all my muscle, literally just melted. I mean, I couldn't shake a hand. I had no strength. I could barely talk. Jeez. And that was shocking. It was shocking for people around me, but shocking for myself. Yeah. But uh, a lot of philosophizing and, uh, you know. Uh, I bet. Now to this day, because I've been through it, I really, really share this information proactively with people that are in the battle still. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that is when you're fighting cancer, and my cancer never hurt. You know, I, I never really knew it was there. Oh, okay. It was a chemo and a side effect that got me. But because you're being poisoned, quite literally. Yeah. But your body is going to do whatever it takes to survive no matter what you do. Mm-hmm. Your body's going to fight to survive. Right. So not a whole lot was involved. So the day that it ended, I said, all right, cool, that's over, back to life. No, as I came to learn is that recovery is literally a thousand times harder than treatment oh. because now your body is trying to recover and it requires active mental participation. Right. Something they don't warn cancer patients about is PTSD is uh, very common. Sure. So that I had to go through six weeks of PTSD. I yeah. mean, where your body is stuck in fight or flight mode and anxiety and then you have depression from all the chemo it was a, it was literally a nightmare i'm not a religious person yeah but i was in hell i was i was convinced that i had died and i was in hell i bet yeah and uh i'm not a suicidal guy mm-hmm. but if i didn't have a family i'm pretty sure i would have shot myself in the head and uh yeah understandable yep yeah, you know ptsd it doesn't just apply to soldiers it, it's traumatic experiences and when your body from all these chemo um, drugs, it feels like it's under attack and it gets stuck in that fight or flight mode that you can't escape. Mm-hmm. And uh, I couldn't sleep, and that's where the real kicker came is I couldn't sleep. And I'd sleep about two hours broken sleep a night. And after about five days, you start to go insane, literally. Yeah, for sure. Yep. So the uh, the doctors gave me drugs, Restoril, all the way up to Ambien. And what I come to learn is, okay, nothing was working, yeah. but the side effects worked. Oh, so no. yeah, when those commercials say side effects may include suicidal thoughts. Oh, yeah. yeah. Because I was just hanging out one day and uh, this thought came and kill yourself. It's like, oh, where did that come from? Right. And uh, man, and then it just wouldn't stop. So I, I was already freaking out my wife, which is the whole experience and just my, my sanity was going. Uh, I dared not say that to her, but I started having these horrible, horrible thoughts about, you know, killing my wife and strangling my kids. Like, this this is not this this can't go on and uh, uh, I said okay well either I'm gonna stop taking this stuff this um, what's it called Ambien or and and all the sleep drugs because they're not working and they're just making me crazy right or or I'm gonna learn to live off two hours live off two hours sleep a night or I'm gonna die right those are my options 
So I said, you know what, I think I'm just going to die. And at this time, my wife took charge because I was completely out of my mind. Yeah. She took charge and she got us downsized and reorganized our life so that if something did happen to me, they were fine. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, she just said, here's what we're doing. Follow my directions. OK, I trust you. Let's do it. So we like our neighborhood. So we moved like literally like 1500 feet away. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> but just downsized everything, got ourselves to a nice little, you know, semi-retirement mode. Mm-hmm. And uh, we moved to this new house right down the road. And she loved the house, and she'd come with me and say, hey, do you like this house? Oh, yeah, it's great, it's great. But in my mind, it's like, oh, I'm never going to live here. I'll be dead by then. Right. You know, started throwing things away and all that. And then uh, at the older house, it was a much bigger house, and I couldn't sleep, so I would just go upstairs to this one corner of the house and literally just pace all night. You yeah, know? what else are you going like, to do? Like, that's it. That's all. Because I also had restless leg syndrome, which sounds so made up, but it's not. Right. I used to make fun of those commercials. <laughs> <laughs> I really did. I'd say, who like, makes please. this crap up? And then it happened to me. It's like, oh, boy, here's karma. <laughs> Karma's kicking in now. That's right. You're like, I, you I know, deserve this. <laughs> yeah, but I did have that thought. It's like, oh, my God, I spent years making fun of that, and it's real. Yeah. And so I, I could just walk and uh, and pace, and I'd get everybody off to bed, get the wife to bed, get the kids to bed, and then I would just pace till the next morning. Mm-hmm. And then I'd lose my mind just for weeks and weeks and weeks. And uh, so went to the new house, and, and as we looked at it, I was thinking, how can I pace in here without disturbing anybody at night? And uh, so we got to our new house, and I, I went, quote, to bed, uh-huh. and I slept for six hours, which was the most I'd slept in like six weeks. Wow. And then I slept for like a month after that. And I come Ooh. to realize the trauma was not only the cancer and the PTSD, it was also my environment, because as much as I loved our old house— you know, I worked out at my house. I was home all the time. Right. And uh, then I went through this experience there. I lost my mind there. And what I came to conclude was that the trauma of it is kind of like maybe like a rape victim. Yeah. Where they return to the place of the crime. Right. And it triggers them. And the moment I was out of there, it went away. Wow. And yeah. So it's it pretty crazy. And even now, like, you know, my Facebook memories pop up in a picture of my old house. It, it, gives me like anxiety i can't look at it really i can't drive by my old house oh yeah it just it uh, that's how it works you know, that's how it works and that, that's how it be so uh yeah i never thought that i'd be saying things like that but for me and i guess other people that's how it works there's some sort of trigger in there and i best just stay away from it and uh so you know i i had fully expected to die so then when i i got some rest and suddenly i started recovering and you know my hair started to go back and i started to be functional and my sanity came back and my wife had held us together for, for months at this point, six months at this point. And finally, she had an emotional breakdown. I thought, you know, you're never coming back. Right. And and I expected to die. So suddenly I said, I don't know what to do with my life now. I don't know where I fit into the world anymore. And that sounds dramatic, but it was 100% accurate. I really don't know where I fit in anymore. I'm sure. And I uh, had to find my place again. And then uh, talk, I have a uh, buddy who's an acting coach. I've gone to his class, and his, his name is Jim Gleason. And he's a real religious dude. But I always loved his inner peace about him, and we never had anything but a professional relationship. And uh, I mm-hmm. called him. I said, "Would you meet with me today for like an hour? I need to talk to you." Yeah. And he's my Facebook friend. He's been very supportive. So we went and we met, and he just talked to me for like four or five hours at the Starbucks. That's so cool. And he just shared his his philosophies on life. A lot of it's based on religion. Of course. Again, I'm not a religious dude, but I took what I needed from that conversation, and uh, to this day, inner peace is what I value the most. And yeah, so I'm I'm forever grateful to him. And uh, I have another buddy who's in a wheelchair for his whole life. Mm-hmm. They keep telling me, oh, you'll be dead by 10, you'll be dead by 20, you'll be dead by 30. Now he's 45 years old. Right. Still in a wheelchair. But, you know, how did he get through life in a wheelchair? But he's functional. He's an IT dude. He drives. He, he does this and that. And, you know, he, he said, he gave me a lot of advice. And he said, well, next phone call that comes, he said, I want you to go do a movie. And uh, I, I had all sorts of lingering side effects like neuropathy where you, you have you, your, your legs and your extremities feel like pins and needles, like when your limbs are asleep. Yeah. Perpetually. Uh-huh. And I had a fight to get all that back, and Jeez. it wasn't easy. So, you know, he talked me into, he said, they call you for a job, go do it. So I got called for some TV show, and I went and I did it. And, I mean, I could barely walk, and they gave me a trailer, and I just slept and slept and slept. I did my scenes, and I left. And then uh, I did this, that Key and Peele movie I mentioned earlier. Keanu. Um, Keanu, yeah, they called me for that, and I ended up doing that. And I'm really, really struggling during that movie. And if you ever watch the movie, you can't tell. Because mm-hmm. I hide it. But I know that the three days of work, I mean, it was 120 degrees out there and I couldn't feel my hands and I'm dropping the gun and can't feel my feet. But I managed to run and I managed to do it all. And I wrote a really uh, nice article for a cancer foundation based on that experience. Mm-hmm. Um, because when that movie was done, 
I reaffirmed to myself, okay, you're back. You can still do this. Maybe your life isn't normal, but it's a new normal and it doesn't have to be a bad thing. Right. You know, in my conclusion, because I'm always got my philosophies, I said, yeah, yeah. you've been, you've been given a second chance. There's no guarantee of a third. True. So you better get your shit together and stop, get out of the self pity and uh, figure it out. So, uh, that's when I started volunteering and, uh, you know, getting involved, and uh, I had also wanted to get into producing and all that stuff. So I said, all right, I'm going to stop uh, just being a cog, and I'm going to start doing my own thing. Yeah. And uh, so that's really been uh, part of the fuel. That's amazing. Yeah, I was yeah. I was going to ask because if you if you get to a point mentally when you like make peace with resigning, you know, mm-hmm. maybe you're like, I think I'm done. I, I was curious as to like what was the thing that made you get back up into the saddle, and that's that's crazy that like. A buddy of yours was like, try Keanu, of all things. And it, like, it, <laughs> he said, take the next movie. Yeah, and you got like a kitten. <laughs> yeah, well, he knows I loved it. And, uh, you know, if, if I put a gun to your head and I was going to shoot you, you'd have about three seconds to make peace and ex- with acceptance. But when you're, you're being poisoned with chemo, which, hey, I'm, I'm grateful for it. You know, it cared me. Yeah, it worked. Um, but you got three months uh, or just longer to head. just sit there in your head and – Ooh. Try to accept death. I mean, that is a slow burn, and yeah. uh, you know, it's not easy. In, in retrospect, oh yeah, this, none of this was difficult. Easier said than done. But the reality, I mean, it was months where I was, you know, just you wouldn't recognize me. I just it was not me. Sure. And uh, then you get this side effect called chemo brain, where I compare oh. to drink a bottle of Nyquil and try to function. Oh no. You can't. You can't think. You can't read. You can't watch TV. You're just a mess. Jeez. Your body comes back, and then you have what's called cancer-related fatigue where your body's trying to readjust again. And I mean, it's a freaking nightmare and yeah. uh, beats the alternative. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, at some point, you know, you over months you say, okay, I'm going to die and I really don't like this, right. but I'm okay with it. So even now to this day, I don't want to die. I don't actively pursue it. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> and if it were to happen, I, I, I hate to say this, but I would, I would be okay with it. I would say, you know what? I, I got a couple extra years out of it. And, uh, been a good run right say my goodbyes and uh, have some stupid movies for people to remember me and yeah <laughs> you know that's it but I, I you follow me on facebook and i'm sure you see on a regular basis i always put up a message up there every now and then hey guys thanks for being part of my life you know yeah i put that up on a fairly regular basis i i'm very very um up front with my emotions with my feelings to, to let people know how i feel about them i'm the same and uh yeah you, you just have to because you never know when you're not going to have that opportunity again totally agree and uh also, uh, I have no, I always had low tolerance for BS and negativity, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I really have no tolerance now. I mean, there's a couple of family members that I've said, say, oh, I don't want a relationship with you. Yeah. No hard feelings. I don't wish you harm, but I just, you, you don't bring anything into my life except grief. Right. And I don't have time for that. And you know, I exactly. won't go into titles, but, uh. You know, when we when I started doing my own films, a couple of buddies that I've gone on this journey with, you know, uh, I lost a couple of friends over it because they had these expectations that I was going to make these films for them to star in. And it's like, it's not about you. It's not about me. It's about what serves the story. Right. If you serve the story, awesome. You're in. If it doesn't, no offense, I'm going to go another direction. They didn't understand that. And they freaking attacked me. It's like, you know what? I Sorry you disagree. But if this is a relationship based on this and. I guess there's no relationship. Right. You just um, They just showed their colors. Yes. They showed their hand, and it didn't go from zero to 60 like that. It started with a phone call. Of course. Let me call you, and let's talk through this, you know. But if that doesn't help and you're still, you know, feeling that way, then maybe the relationship wasn't as strong as I thought it was. Right, right. I, I love that we, like you and a couple other people that I know, we have this, like, mentality that I really, really respect in that you're not defined by – the trials and tribulations Mm -hmm. you use them as fuel to be creative and to spread the opposite you know it's like you're given the hell but then you give it back as love and i think that's i think that takes a really strong person i think it's i think it's great well you know i'd uh i I, it's something for something so horrible to happen it's like okay this sucked that it happened but i can almost justify that i'm okay with it if if i can do something with it so to this day i relate yeah, <laughs> to this to this day, I know that I've saved friends' lives um, through my talking about it. 
you know, I, I know that I've helped at this point hundreds of people, you know, uh, with phone calls and messages and just listening to them and, and knowing that they're not alone. Because that's what killed me so much is I, I, I never had a support group or nobody that could relate. When I eventually found it, I said, my God, I wish I had found this month earlier because I just needed somebody who'd been there to tell me. I, I was there, dude, and 10 years later, look, I'm still here and I'm okay. Right. You know, and to answer my questions. So when I deal with phone calls and all that, it, it's usually the first question always, am I going to die? And the answer is always yes. Right. But from this, probably not. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and they need somebody to say, listen, man, everything that I'm experiencing, you've been through there. Like, yeah, I've done it, dude. I've done the PTSD. I've done the insanity. I've done all that stuff. But look, it's five years later and I'm fine. Life is great. Right. And sometimes that's all they need to hear. It goes to show. You know? I mean, it, to, sometimes you have to see it to believe it. And yeah. to see someone who's been down the exact same road. Mm -hmm. Like an alcoholic almost. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I, that's another thing that I, I think is really cool is that, you know, you're passing that on. I think, yeah. I think it's so important because it's, mm -hmm. you're right. Like you went through all of that and then for what? You know what I mean? Right. You can make mm -hmm. it mean something as opposed to just being dealt a bad hand. And right. like helping people through is amazing. And everybody deals with things in their own way because I, I know some people that they just never want to acknowledge that I had cancer. I don't want anybody to know. Right. Uh, it's my business. Okay, cool. You, know, you do things your way, but uh, I'm going to do things my way. And it, it, it's such a burden and it tortures your soul that for me, I have to get it off my chest I, because I tried keeping it to myself. Right. And it made things a thousand times worse. It made me angry and it made me bitter. And, and uh, it's like I have to get this off my, my, my chest. That's why I talk about it so much and I, I take the phone calls. And, uh, but every now and then still, you know, every, maybe every three or four months, I mean, all this emotion will come out and I'll just pull over and I'll cry for five or 10 minutes and say, yeah. this was a horrible thing that happened to me. But I know that I'm just going to, if I feel that way, I know that it's okay to pull over, get it out. All right. That sucked. Go on with my day. Right. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's life. It, life keeps mm -hmm. on going. Yeah. And, uh, I'm not so macho and egotistical that you know, I'm 46 years old. Hey, if that's what needs to happen for me to be. Uh, to have my inner peace and to be emotionally stable, then that's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to carry around just for five five weeks until it happens on its own or I blow up at somebody. Sure. You know, I'm going to pull over and I'm going to let it out because it's there and uh, go with my day. There you go. Yeah. That's a way to do it. And to think, you're still in movies and you're making your own stuff now. Like, yeah. th that's so cool. I love that. Yep. So it's fun. I would like to really do a documentary on the whole cancer thing one day. Uh, yeah, you should. I will, because um, because our goal is every every project we make has to be different, right? You know, so uh, I, I hopeless was like our sci-fi epic, mm -hmm. and we did something called The Sovereign Citizen, which is a dark comedy. Nice. Uh, something in the works called Hell Heist, which is a horror um, detective. Love it. Uh, we did something called Magically Me, which is on the indie uh, film fest circuit right now. Mm -hmm. um, that's a social topic. Nice. Um, we did Devotion. We just finished, which is a, a horror. And uh, so we always challenge ourselves. Every project should be different. We're not doing the same things over and over again. Yeah. Um, so documentary would fit right in there. And uh, so I, I know how to do it now. I have uh -huh. a pretty good understanding of how to do it. And just a matter of time. I mean, there's so many projects we have lined up that are just waiting for time. And I, I don't have enough lifetimes sure. to do it all. <laughs> I mean... You got to try it. <laughs> yeah. And in the meantime, you know, uh, I've fallen, I've fallen uh, best into the producer role. Yeah. But we just did this thing called Devotion that I directed. Cool. And, uh, you know, at this point I have a crew, a solid crew of five or six guys is our inner core. And then we have an outer core of like 12 people and then a super outer core of like 50 people. Yeah. And we all work together. And uh, everything has to be different. And I, I, I never have a desire to be a leading man. Mm -hmm. I always give myself a small role, yeah. and I'm happy with that. You know, I don't need to be yeah. king shit. You're doing a hundred other things. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, yep. But you know what? I, I still want to uh, – I still do other people's movies. You know, uh, people call me, hey, John, can you come help us out? Yeah, of course. Yeah. You know, I'll go do that. I, I still do auditions. You know, I just did an audition for a cop because, nice. of course, and I did an audition for a serial killer, which I really hoped I'd get yeah. <laughs> just because it's different. Sure. But uh, I still do that stuff. But, uh, yeah, I'll still do small roles and uh, – but I just see the producer thing. And even just being the producer, I'm also teaching myself everything else. I'm learning. I do most of our editing. I do the audio. Oh, cool. Because I don't need to be the best at everything. I just need to understand it so I can manage it. That's true. That makes so, a good leader. Yep. Yeah. And uh, except, there's one except. 
Uh-oh. special effects. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to, but the time request required to do that. Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah, for real. Uh, yeah. So I've gotten good at editing. Like I said, I'll send you some links behind the scenes uh, stuff that you can see. Sweet. Because we're looking pretty good at, at uh, this point. I'm excited to see it. The stuff that I've seen already looks really, really cool. So I'm you can see it. the evolution too. I mean, from the pop card stuff with an iPhone to where we're at now. Yeah, for sure. You know. Yeah. Is it, it so? Devotion is mm-hmm. that. The longest thing that you've made so far, as far as time uh, length, or no, is hopeless going to be hopeless? And uh, Sovereign Citizen, I think, is twenty minutes long. Really? If you've never watched that, yeah. You know what a Sovereign Citizen is? Uh, sounds familiar. It's a okay, legal sh- term, right? Sh- well, I'm sure you've seen these on on YouTube. Uh-huh. A Sovereign Citizen is somebody who doesn't believe that uh, the United States has any legal jurisdiction over them, oh. so they get pulled over by cops, and they say, "Well, I'm not bound right. by the laws." They're, You've seen those videos. They're their own country in and of yes. themselves. Yes. yes. Yep, yep, yep. You've seen those. And yeah. they always end the same way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> With true. a tasing or an arrest or a beating or something. Right, right. So for whatever reason, I don't know, two years ago, so me and my buddy that I write with were just watching and laughing at these Sovereign Citizen videos over and over. Right. And I play a lot of GTA Five with right. him. So we sit there and talk, and we're just you know talking on our asses. And so yeah. we should write a skit about that. So we ended up writing... Uh, the Sovereign Citizen, and uh, it's about oh, 15 minutes long, and I'm actually going to send you the uh, the trailer to it. Or the, uh, Sweet. And then you got to go back and watch it. That's cool. So do you think that you'll start like <laughs> like as a feature in the future? Because uh, yeah. you're building um, up. It's getting more and more. Exactly. That's the idea is because on every – we do these different genres, and the more we do, we're still very much teaching ourselves. Right. And right now, you know – um, there is a buildup. There's there's something that's already on IMDb, IMDb that we have called um, director's cut. So eventually, when I'm ready to actually, okay, this is going to be some money now. This is going to be full blown, blah blah blah. Right. Director's cut is waiting, which has been written for I don't know, three years or so, ready to go. It's a two two parter. Nice. And that'll be a feature. But uh, Michael Anglin, who I work with, uh, he did a, a feature called Consequences, which we have on Amazon now. And uh, he brought cool. me in on that as an actor, and I also helped do some of the producing on the ass end. Yeah. And, uh, but as you as you write original content, you know, now we're uh, starting to get into some film festivals. Um, got that on Amazon. We'll be putting more stuff on Amazon. And uh, there really is no goal. We'll see what happens. You right. Because to say my goal is to have a movie in every movie theater in America and to be the next Titanic uh-huh. probably isn't going to happen. Sure. You know, but what we can do is give ourselves achievable goals. I know that getting on Amazon is a pretty achievable goal. Right. I know that winning a festi- film festival is a pretty achievable goal. Mm-hmm. You know, so magically me, this this one we did uh, won five awards at a film festival two years nice. ago. Nice. And it's actually I'm going to a film festival this coming Saturday to, to air it again. Uh-huh. You know, we we use Film Freeway. I've been putting our stuff into film festivals around the world. And a lot of acceptance. Finally, we got a semifinalist in one now. Hey. Um, consequences is one a couple. But um, one thing, I guess, as an artist mm-hmm. is what makes this scary is um, you you have to be confident because everything I write, I write for stuff that I would find funny or I would find interesting. I write the story for me as selfish as I, as they say. No, it's the best that way might to sound. Go. I write it for myself. Yeah. Now I think I'm hilarious. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's um, the first step really. <laughs> Otherwise, why are you writing it? <laughs> right. I think I'm hilarious. And uh, most people find me semi amusing and I can make people laugh and hold their attention. Right. And, uh, I'm a, I'm a pretty good communicator, but when you write a story using the sovereign citizen as an example, I wrote that, Supposed to never even really be seen. Mm-hmm. It was, you know, let's, I said, we did Hopeless. I got to do something else just because I want to try out some new stuff with the camera. So we did the Sovereign Citizen. I wrote it. Jason Stanley, the Jason Statham lookalike, came back for that. He, he played the Sovereign Citizen. He's a great actor. Amazing. And uh, said it'd be 15 minutes long. So we filmed it over three days. And um, when it was all done, I mean, it took months to edit it. And uh, it's, it's a nonprofit thing. So there's like a Bob Dylan song in it. And uh, threw it on YouTube under their license. And uh, and when I put it out there, I said, okay, comments on or off. <laughs> I mean, I really struggled with that for like two weeks before yeah. I posted it. And I said, this is what makes it scary. Because if I work on, you know, Logan or Planet of the Apes and the movie sucks, I don't care. There's right. a job. It's I not, got paid. It's not yours. Yeah. <laughs> right. 
and I continue to get paid off residuals on great, cool. Hell yeah. You know? Uh, but, but it's not it's mine. Yours, it's personal. Yes. So, so the, the hits sovereign go right citizen. to you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And this is one time that I could really say in the past few years through all this film stuff that I actually paused and said, how am I going to react if I just get blasted for this? Sure. And you fuck with sovereign citizens, am I going to get death threats? These were all <laughs> legitimate concerns, you That's know? true. That's true. It is. You don't want to mess because, with a foreign government. <laughs> oh, yeah. There, there are. We have a Facebook page for the sovereign citizen, and every now and then we get a post saying, you guys are a bunch of fucking idiots and really threatening. <laughs> oh, and no. I just block them. But those Smart. guys are dead serious, you know, and I'm, we're making fun of them. And not only that, if you watch a skit, we're making fun of the cops just as bad. Right. That's the whole are. ridiculous scenario. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and... uh so you, we're making fun of it, but hey, you know, I'm 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 forty some years old and influenced by Monty Python, and you know, yeah. you, you you pick on things you shouldn't pick on. Absolutely, and uh, that's what's funny. And uh, but I really struggled with that, and I said, if if this doesn't go over well, man, I'm going to feel stupid, and it's going to affect me. And how do you go <laughs> forward? Sure. So you know what? I, I swallowed my pride, and I put it on YouTube, and I put it on Facebook, and I left the comments open. Oh. And then uh, the comments started coming in, and I shit you not, even now you can look at the comments on that. They're 99% positive. There you go. <laughs> because apparently everybody else finds sovereign citizens as silly as I do. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, hopeless, um, as long as it's taken, I've shown a lot of footage at conventions, mm -hmm. specifically with 501st members. Nice. And again, you're, you're a 501st member, so I'm going to show you some footage uh, yeah, yeah. and get your thoughts on it. And uh, because if I'm making this for anybody, it's for Star Wars fans. Mm -hmm. And because they're going to get the jokes. All these fan films are serious. They're usually revolving around uh, lightsaber fights and people want to show some cool action. Right. Hopeless is a comedy played straight. It is a full-blown comedy. Amazing. But you know what? Even in the world of fan films, it's unique. Yeah, it's true. And uh, every fan film, like I said, is pretty serious. You know, And uh, they yep. want to... Uh, Usually want to do a Jedi fight is usually what they want to do. Right, right. Oh, but yeah, check that out and check out those special effects and see what you think because I want it to be, I want it to look like it would fit in to a Star Wars movie. How long from the concept of the idea for Hopeless to now, how long has it been so far in production? Oh, geez, almost, probably about two and a half years. Two and a half years. Mm -hmm. That's pretty great. It'll make it that much better when it comes out. Yep. And, uh, you know, we, we know a couple of movie theater owners in our area. Yeah. Oh, cool. That have said, you guys want to have a premiere? Come have a premiere. So uh, we're ready for that. We'll, you know, get a little backdrop printed up at the printer so people can take their photographs in front of it and then uh, invite everybody in who is in it. And they can bring their friends and family. They can wear their 501st outfits, take some pictures. There Can't sell go. tickets, obviously, but that's the biggest reward for the people that worked on this and have waited so long is that they need to see it on the big screen. Right. You could turn it into an mm -hmm. event for them. That's cool. Yeah. I that's, like it. Uh, that, that's a big thing. So we already had like posters printed that we've given everybody. You know, you had a choice between 11 and 17. So I can get the bigger ones printed up 27 by 40. Sure. But we haven't done that yet. But the 11 by 17s are out there. That's so cool. Yeah. It, you're doing it. It's going to be great when it's done because then you could breathe. Yeah. And uh, I guess for the most part, a good chunk of it's already done. Sure. But, uh, so what but, uh, what is some advice you would give to people that wanted to like go the indie route? Like, because you've learned a ton in such a short amount of time. Yeah, and you know, I, I, there's a networking event where I, I talk to filmmakers and all that. And we have a film community here, and every now and then they'll come up and ask me to, That's to talk. Cool. Yeah. And uh, so I did one a few months back, and uh, I just go up and, and I say, "Hey, um, I show them some footage. You know, what do you right. guys think? Oh, it looks great. And, you know, hand uh, hand clap. You know, we go to conventions, and uh, I'll do panels on how to get into film and follow it up by this." Mm -hmm. My advice is always uh, film today is where music was 20 years ago. The record industry was in control. I don't know how old you are, Brian. 25? 28. 28. I'm an old. old man, John. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, when I grew up, we had CDs, tapes, 8-tracks, all that shit. Right. And then digital came along, and then Napster blew up the record industry. Yes, it did. I okay. remember I this. Know, you remember that. And okay. I remember I mean, LimeWire. Blew it up. <laughs> yes. Yep. Blew it up. I mean, completely. To this day, 
the record industry is destroyed. Yep. All the power is back in the hands of the artists. It is scorched earth. It is. You know, uh, <laughs> I was looking at Jewel's page, you know, the other day behind a Jewel album or something. Yeah, yeah. And she produces her own stuff now because she can't. She doesn't need the studios like they did before where they were just held by the balls. Yep. And uh, film is exactly there today where, oh, you know, the reason why it. we see franchises and we see reboots is because ultimately the movie industry is an industry. They right. create products. Mm-hmm. If I say, hey, I'm going to make a new Star Wars episode 10 tomorrow, yep. before I even write one word, I know that I've made half a billion dollars at least. Right. If I make it. a new Ghostbusters, yeah, it's an existing franchise. It's a guaranteed sell. Jurassic mm-hmm. World 3, new Ghostbusters. The reason why you're seeing so many franchises and reboots is because they're safe bets. Right. All the original content, which used to be risk, was taken by studios in you know 70s, 80s, 90s. You don't really see that anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, all the risk is going to Netflix and AMC and Showtime with Dexter and, you know, Sopranos. These smaller people that don't have as much to lose are taking the risk and they're reaping the rewards, you know, Breaking Bad. Yeah. Um, Better Call Saul. They're, they're reaping the rewards of taking those risks where Disney, Universal, they're not going to take those risks because they it's can't. It's a business. Yeah. It's a business. They can't take those risks. So with the advent of Netflix and Redbox and iTunes and, and Vimeo, Anybody can make a movie today because you and I and everybody else on this planet, civilized world, have a studio in your pocket now right. on your iPhone. So anybody can make a movie today. What you do with it or how seriously you take it is up to the individual. Sure. You know, you can put things on YouTube. So I, I call it, we're in the punk rock garage band days of the 70s now. Yeah. Where the power no longer belongs to the studio, it belongs to the individual. So uh, I can't make any money on Hopeless, but I got value out of it because it taught me what to do and what not to do. Mm -hmm. It's going to get me viewers. You know, that's going to bring me my audience. I made a joke about – I showed you a joke in that uh, that devotion clip with the Pop-Tart box. Right. You know, and uh, as a a thanks to everybody that watched those that got us to this level, every – Everything I do will always have a Pop Tart reference. <laughs> there you go. I like it. And uh, yeah, so you, that that's hidden in there. So every single clip we do will always have some sort of Pop Tart reference, just as a, a, an eye wink, because that audience has followed us. Right. You know, it's like a cameo of like exactly, a nod to the audience that I've been there. Yes. Hey guys, you came with us. This one's for you. you right. Know, we always we always think of you when we're doing this stuff it's like uh <laughs> it's like tarantino's like red apple cigarettes it's exactly like we've got the yeah. jo- john army ho pop tart exactly I and and it. it's funny you mentioned tarantino because you know we get our influences from uh from from our life yeah, yeah. and uh so you know one thing that always stands out about quentin tarantino even adam sandler is that they use the same people over and over again yes yeah. so i use the same people over and over again I you love know, it. They're my buddies. I, I trust them. And it's also a way for them to stretch their chops. Hey, John, you know, Jen Foreman, who's in Hopeless as uh, the female commander, she joined us because she never got to do action. Right. She always gets little cute girl roles. Or she gets a hooker or something, you know. Uh-huh. Um, she's very typecast just as I am. Sure. But this, she got to do something. She's got a gun and she's shooting and she's leading people. And it's just, you know, an opportunity for her to stretch her wings in a different direction. Sure. You know, and... uh Michael England, my partner, you know, he, he gets a lot of typecast things as well. So, you know, he wants to try different things. I want to try different things that, you know, my personality does not match my appearance. You know, I'd like to do comedy. I like to do fun stuff, but I'll never sure. get that. I got cast once in Preacher and they cut it uh, <laughs> <laughs> in a comedic role. Right. Even if I'm in a comedy, even if they throw me in a Will Ferrell movie, I'm a cop. I'm right. Silly. So if I'm ever going to do it, I'm going to have to do it myself. But, uh, going back to Quentin Tarantino and Adam Sandler, um, yeah, I like to use the same people over. You have a lot of recurring themes. And uh, even Kevin Smith, what I like about Kevin Smith is his self-awareness. All his characters take place in the same universe. Right. So as I've gotten to the point now where I think we have four or five different productions in the works, mm-hmm. either completed or, or in post-production, they all take place in the same universe. That's cool. So <laughs> the two, there's three cops in The Sovereign Citizen. Mm-hmm. Um, two of them are the cops that are in Devotion. The oh. same names are the same characters, the same personalities. And then we just did Perfect. a little skit the other day called Flops, a, a parody of cops. Again, two of the cops, th- I'm sorry, three of the cops from Sovereign Citizen, they're in that again. You know, I, I have a little series of shorts called Sheriff Jackie that I do with my dachshund. Uh-huh. 
And uh, it's like, okay, Sheriff Jackie needs to fit into my universe. How is that going to happen? I don't know if you've ever watched Sheriff Jackie. Yeah, yeah. But it, okay, you it's narrated. <laughs> right, he's got his little hat on, and he's the uh, he's the lone constable of Happy Valley, and yeah. <laughs> his catchphrase is "fuck off," and you know, his cute little dog with a dirty mouth, and takes the job very seriously. But it's all narrated. Right. It's all narrated, and it's like, okay, how am I going to work Sheriff Jackie into this? Right. You know, because it doesn't fit. So in Devotion, for example, Love managed it. to work him in there. There so you again, go. We we want to keep. Uh, our own universe going. Yeah, I'm into it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think that's fun. I agree. A lot of inside jokes. I think it's you know, important when making your own stuff for it to be fun. Otherwise, what are you doing? Because it's, yeah. it's a lot of work. Like, it's fun, it but is. it's a lot of work. So if you're not enjoying it, come on. Yeah. And, uh, you know, growing up in the 80s, um, especially Burt Reynolds movies, the credits always had bloopers. Right. So uh, in our credits, I'm very fond of having bloopers and behind the scenes stuff. So like in Devotion, if you go back and watch that unfinished uh, video that you're watching, uh-huh. the credits are actually in there. And we always have a behind the scenes guy filming video. Cool. And the credits is nothing but behind the scenes to show that, hey, uh, we had fun doing this. Sovereign Citizen has great, um, great bloopers that make up the entire credits. Um so uh, even on Hopeless, we're going to have some sort of – it's going to break from Star Wars tradition. Sure. And, uh, it's going to have the classic credits, but it's also going to show some footage also to like show that, it. hey, we did have fun doing this. Yeah, there you go. The, the, and the, we are friends. The years were worth it. Mm-hmm. I'm into it. Yep. I'm into it. And just like that, you know, we've been talking for over an hour and a half. Yep. Not boom. surprising. Boom. Yeah, exactly. That's true. You know what? That's mm-hmm. very true on multiple levels because the first time we talked, we talked for like five hours. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a tradition. Yep. But I, some things in common. Yeah. So I, I have to ask uh, before I let you go, um, where can people find you online? Where can they find your stuff, your films that you're making? Talk to me. Uh, on Facebook, you just got to type in um, America's Movie Cop. Love it. And uh, funny story behind that. America's Movie Cop, John Armejo, you'll find me on YouTube. We are under Our Fun, with an exclamation, Productions. Cool. Independent Films. Um, that's the two easiest place on uh, Instagram, America's Movie Cop. I love Quick it. story, America's Movie Cop. So uh, when I first got into film, I was you know, very, very typecast as cop. Uh-huh. So I became what my, I told my wife at the time. I, I'm set famous. She said, what's that mean? <laughs> I said, well, I know all these cast and crew at this point because it's a local community. And every time I'd walk onto a set, they would joke with me and say, hey, movie cops here. It's movie cop. Oh, nice. And they would just pick on me, which I don't care. Yeah, whatever. And then uh, I worked with Arnold Schwarzenegger in a movie called Escape Plan for a couple weeks. Love it. And we're not best friends or hanging out. But uh, one of his Yet. quotes is, hey, you always got to take your biggest liability and turn it into your biggest asset. Right. So I said, all right, you know, I need to brand myself. So how am I going to brand myself? I said, well, people are always making fun of me. They're already calling me Movie Cop. I'll just make it into a spoof and call it America's <laughs> Movie Cop just to see if it works as a marketing Right. <laughs> Get yourself around. You know what? Oh, it works. Yeah. <laughs> to this day, they call me America's Movie Cop. Hey, yeah, there you go. Say, hey, it's America's favorite movie cop or the America's best movie cop. Sure. But you know what? It, it stuck. Yeah, it did. <laughs> it did. Goof. Yep. Hey, whatever works. Whatever makes you more memorable in the future is that's that's how to go. You got to brand yourself. That's amazing. So my last name cop. is unpronounceable, so I'll be America's movie cop. <laughs> they remember that. There you go. It's not our wait. So it's not our Mijo. It's our Mijo. Oh, I knew that. Yep. Yep. <laughs> cool. Yep. America's movie cop. I dig it. And you that's got that it. SEO. That's right. Beautiful. <laughs> and. Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it's at Pod of Interest on Twitter. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. You can also find me at BrianBalance.com. That's balance with two L's. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. A good rating or review always helps. Let them know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch. 
Just search The Interesting Podcast on tpublic.com to get you some sweet gear. Also, I made a Patreon. So if you'd like to support the show and get access to other exclusive shows about a bunch of random things, you can now do that at patreon.com slash jedibrian. On that note, special thanks to Chris, Ben, Jim, Daz, Kelly, Daryl, Logan, Victor, JC, and Christina. Your support means so much to me, and I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well.